Okay, first of all, how many people are interested in maybe a career in investing? Okay, well then this will be good. This is, I tried to uh, jot down a few lessons that I learned in the first couple of years that I, uh, that I got on the, on the trading desk. I, I got three lessons. Um, we'll, uh, maybe we can, oop, there it is, okay, oops. Actually, can you push it back one? Uh, we'll just go as far as we get. You know, it's, if we only get to lesson two, it's, it's fine. Um, uh, actually, uh, I should tell you the story of how I, I got to Solomon Brothers in the first place. I, um, I was teaching at Harvard Business School. Uh, I had just come right out of a PhD at MIT. Uh, you know, I w it was, you had to go and, and teach, so I went down the street to Harvard. I didn't, didn't like it too much, uh, the case method, and it was, uh, I don't know, I just didn't find it that interesting. I got much more interested in some of the consulting assignments that I was working on, and I'll talk about that in a sec. So it was um, uh, May of 1984 and I was grading exams and I got a call from a partner at Solomon who said, uh, I hear you've got some great students. Uh, would one of them be interested in this arbitrage job and he explained it and Meriwether and the whole shoot match. And I said, I've got the best guy I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 30. And he said, too old. But two weeks later, I started, uh, I started on the trading desk. Uh, I reported to a guy who was 25. And uh, I remember the first day I sort of strolled in at 9 o'clock. My, my boss, Meriwether, my boss's boss wasn't around. There were four guys in the group. I reported to this 25-year-old. Uh, and... Um, I stroll in at 9 o'clock, I got a coffee, I got the journal, I got my feet up on the desk, reading the paper, and uh, he sort of strolls over and says, let me tell you what's what. And he said, at 7 o'clock, I want you to get me coffee, and at noon, I want you to get me lunch. Any questions? And I sort of put my feet down and said, well, how do you take your coffee? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so we got three different lessons. One is on futures and forwards, volatility trading, and structured finance. Okay, so uh, I did some recruiting when I was at Solomon. And I used to ask uh, some of the new recruits uh, this question. Suppose that, um, suppose that IBM mid-market price is 100, and you're a market maker in IBM stock. So you might, so when customers come to you, you're a 99 and a half bid, and you will sell at 100 and a half, just trying to, to make the spread. Um, so that, that would be kind of a standard market maker. But suppose a customer came to you and said, you know what, I'm prepared to commit today to either buying or selling IBM, and we'll agree on a price today, but I want to consummate the deal a year from now. So a year from now, we'll, we'll trade money and we'll trade the stock. I'm not going to tell you whether I'm a buyer or a seller. Make me a market in IBM one year forward, a one-point market. Well, what information do you need to know? Do you need to know how well the economy is doing? Is the stock market going to be going up? Remember, you're making this market for IBM a year out. Do you need to know about the computer industry as a whole to make this market? 
Or do you need to just know about how well you think the prospects for IBM are? Or is it sort of a combination of all of the above? Well, the answer is you don't need to know any of this. All you need to know is the risk-free rate of interest. Why? Because we can hedge today any trade that we do. Let's suppose that the uh, interest rate is 5%. You don't need to know whether IBM's going up or down. All you need to know is that the risk-free rate is 5%. Because you can hedge out all of your risk. Okay, suppose that the guy lifts you. Suppose the guy buys IBM from you one year forward. So let's say you make a market uh, at 104 and a half, one, so he lifts you at 105 and a half. So you're short IBM. How do you hedge yourself? Well, what you do is you buy IBM today at 100 and you borrow $100 using IBM as collateral and one year from now you give him the IBM and you pay off your loan of a hundred at a hundred plus the interest rate of five percent you pay it off at 105 you've produced IBM at 105 a year from now and you've sold it for 105 and a half you make a half a point how about if he hits you at 104 and a half? What do you do? Well, to hedge yourself, you sell IBM today. Well, you got to borrow IBM. You borrow IBM, you give them cash as collateral, and you, uh, you unwind the trade from now. You produce your short at 105, and you make a half a point. You don't need to know anything about the economy, how well IBM is going to do, because you can, hedge your, you can hedge out all of the risk of this trade today. You can do the arbitrage. There's no risk. You're still making your same half a point, and you've got no, you're out no cash, and there's no uncertainty here. So I asked this question, you'd be amazed how many PhDs, you know, kind of say, well, you got to know whether IBM's going up or down and what on. No, you can hedge it all out today. This is arbitrage. Okay, so right before I started at Solomon, I was working on this consulting project. It was a real estate developer, a big real estate developer in Boston. Uh, and he would build these uh, big high-rise uh, construction projects and he would borrow money from a bank uh, at LIBOR plus a spread. Um, but this, I have to tell you, in the early 80s, it was chaos in the bond market. You know, you had rates going from 8% uh, all the way up to 15% on 30-year bonds. Uh, LIBOR got up to about 18%. There was a lot of volatility. This developer wanted to somehow cap his interest rate costs so that he could concentrate on building the building and not go out of business because of, uh, because interest rates, he knew the building worked for him at today's interest rates. So he wanted to cap them. So he said, could you construct a hedging program almost like the IBM forwards that can cap my costs. Also he was being shown some uh, cap derivatives uh, by you know another bank where he could actually cap his cost. He had a three-year loan so he had 12 different resets. So every quarter for three years, uh, there would be a LIBOR fixing, and that was what he was trying to, um, 
That's what he was trying to lock in. Currently, rates were at uh, 9%. If they were 9% flat, you can see that out in, uh, you know, in the 12th quarter, uh, there'd be a distribution of rates around that 9%. You could think about valuing, what is a cap? It just says that if rates go above, uh, you're capped at 9%. It's essentially a call option on, on yields, if you will. That if rates go above 9%, you're still capped at 9%. If rates go below uh, 9%, well, then you get the lower interest rate. It's, it's like a call option on, uh, on yields. And uh, so when he, um, when he was shown this, um, this capped, these 12, they're 12, essentially 12 interest rate options for these caps, the bank, since LIBOR was at 9%, had valued the option using a high volatility, because interest rate volatility was high at the time, but they had assumed, since there was no market for these four words in LIBOR, uh, there, there were, wasn't a futures market in LIBOR that would go out 12 quarters. They just assumed a flat interest rate structure. But in reality, the term structure, if you looked at treasury yield curve, it was very upward sloping so you can imagine that uh, the LIBOR yield curve would be upward sloping if, if the LIBOR treasury spread stayed about the same. So you can see that out in this 12th quarter, it wasn't a 9% forward yield. It was more like a 12% forward. So how could you go about hedging uh, the, um, how could you go about uh, hedging this, uh, if you bought the cap from, well, let's, let's take it back. Suppose you bought these options from, from a bank. How could you go about locking in the profit if they assumed that interest rates were going to be 9% but yet they were really up here more at 12%. So you bought the option at 9%. How would you go about locking in your profit? Yeah. Would you just buy a treasury bond? Right? Yeah, you really want to essentially buy this uh, treasury bond like a zero that, that's right here. You essentially buy the bond so that if the market rallies, you, you make all of it. If, let's say the market stays the same. And, and stays the same at 9%. Well, eventually that forward that's at 12% will come down to 9% and you'll make 300 basis points. And if it goes even lower, that's great. So you can lock in today, you can do the arbitrage yourself by buying the caps and buying bonds. Let me just give you one interesting tidbit here on futures, suppose, suppose there was futures that went out there and they were at 12% yield. Is that the forward rate? Is that the forward you're locking in? Well, the answer is no. There's, there's a little bit of extra convexity here in these interest rate futures that I think is sometimes overlooked. Uh, so remember, so we were going to buy the cap and go long the future or long bonds. Um, but uh, how is this future different than a forward rate? Well, if you take a look at uh, futures, so let's say you bought a euro dollar future that was at 12%. Um, if the market rallies, well, first of all, if it were a forward, no money changes hands until that 12th quarter, until three years out. But for a futures market, every day margin goes back and forth. If you bought the future as your hedge and the market rallies, you've made money. So 
rates go from 12%, let's say, down to 11 and a half. The market ra futures go up, yields go down. You make money. Margin comes into you. Cash comes into you. You then reinvest that at the 11 and a half rate, not the 12. You invested at, reinvested at the now current forward rate. So at a number slightly less than the forward. Suppose you, if you were to, if the market fell, so if rates go from 12% to uh, 12 and a half, you have to pay money with a future. With a forward, you don't settle up till later. You pay money and you're sort of out an interest rate of 12 and a half, which is higher than the 12. So kind of, if you were short future, if you were short futures, it's just the opposite way around. So kind of being long futures is a bad deal. Because when the market rallies, you reinvest at a lower rate. When the market falls, you, you're out money at a high rate. It's bad to be long futures. So you have to incent people to be long futures versus a forward. How do you do that? You give them a little extra. So maybe the yield has to go up to 1210 for futures to compensate them. So a forward might be at 12%, but the futures would be at 1210 because of this, the negative convexity of the margin. Just a little twist that sometimes gets overlooked. All right, we're, we're moving quickly here. The second, uh, the second example I wanted to give you is, uh, is volatility arbitrage or dynamic hedging. Um, my first year on the desk, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade introduced a brand new uh, security. It was called an option on a 10-year note future. Uh, at the time, 10-year um, note futures were at 80, and uh, they came out with these options, these 86 calls uh, that was about, uh, had about a one-month expiration date were very rich, offered at a um, very high volatility, I was the first person to ever sell, you know, on, the, on, on these contracts. So I sold some of these uh, 86 calls on something where the underlying was at 80. So obviously if the price goes above 86, I'm going to have to make good dollar for dollar on that. If the price is below 86, I don't have to pay anything. I've sold the option, so I take in some premium. Well, how do you hedge this? Let's take example, uh, let's take a real simple option. Suppose that, you, suppose that the underlying was at 86 and you sold 100 calls struck at 86 and it only had one day to go. How would you hedge yourself? So the underlying is right at the strike price and it's only got one day to go. So when do you have to pay off? Obviously you have to pay off if the market goes above 86. You gotta pay off dollar for dollar above it. If it goes below 86, you don't have to pay anything. Well, the, he the hedge in this case, if you sold these calls, is you have to buy something. Uh, you have to buy the underlying. How much do you have to buy well, it turns out that since it's right at the strike, if you assume sort of a random market, you know, over the next day, half the time it's going to be above the strike and half the time it's going to be below the strike. So the hedge ratio, the probability of the option being in the money is a half. The hedge ratio is a half. So the answer is if you sold 100 calls, you need to buy 50 futures. 
So if the market goes up to 87, you lose a point on 100 contracts. You remember you sold 100 calls, but you make a point on your hedge, so you're net out minus 50. Okay? So if the market goes up a point, you're down 50. If the market goes down a point, well then how much are you out on your calls? Zero. But you're long 50 contracts, you've lost a point on that, you're net out 50. So in both cases, you have the same identical outcome. You're perfectly hedged. Now you might say to yourself, why would you ever do this trade where in every state of the world you've lost money? The answer is you took in premium for selling the option. Hopefully you took in more than 50, you'd make money. If you sold the option for exactly 50, you'd break even if this happened. Okay, so that's the hedge if there's one day to go and you're right at the money. If, well, let's, let's suppose there was two days to go and you, and you did that hedge um, and, uh, and the market went from 86 up to 87. So now the option is much more in the money. It has one day to go. Probably the odds of it going out of the money, that the back down below 86 might be pretty low for just one day. So what do you have to do to change your hedge ratio? Remember your long 50 contracts with, and now, it, so let's say there's one day to go and the option is way in the money. What do you have to do? You have to buy more contracts. Because now, for every movement on that final day, for every movement up, you're dollar for dollar out. And for every movement down, it's still going to be in the money. It's almost as if you were short the future, so you have to buy 100%. What if the market went way down? What do you have to do? Well, now the, the, how do you have to adjust your hedge ratio? Now the odds of, the odds of the stock market, or the, the market rallying enough so that it's in the money are very low, so you don't need any hedge. So when the market goes down, you need to sell out your 50 contracts. So, Let's think about this strategy once again. You put on a hedge. As the market goes up, you're a buyer. That's your dynamic hedge. As the market goes down, you're a seller. So as the market goes up at the high, you're a buyer. You're a buyer at the high. As the market goes down, you're a seller at the low crazy strategy, right? Who would ever do this strategy? Buy at the high, sell at the low. The answer is you were paid a premium to do it. So every single one of your hedging trades is a losing trade. But against it you've taken in this premium. So this strategy is referred to as dynamic hedging. If you're long or short an option, you can generate it by dynamically trading in the underlying. You put on the hedge ratio to start, and then as the market moves, you have to, your hedge ratio adjusts. As the market goes up, you're a buyer if you're short an option. As the market goes down, you're a seller. Well, this option is struck at 86, and I sold it when the future was at 80. So what do I have to do to hedge? I have to buy some futures. How much futures do I need to buy? Well, obviously it's less than 50%. It's much less because the probability of it being in the money is, is low. But I have to buy some futures. Why have I done this trade? I've done the trade because the implied volatility 
in the options that I've sold was much higher than I thought would be realized. So I think that my hedging trans, if that's the case, my hedging transactions are going to lose less money than, uh, than, my, um, than the option premium I've taken in. If I sold these options at a 15% volatility, and, vol and actual volatility is 10%, then my expected profit is five vol points. So another way of calculating the expected profit is you can look at the options that I sold at let's say a 15% vol, and that's a certain premium, and you can then reprice those options at a 10% vol, and the difference is how much I'll make in expectation. But the path matters. This path over the next month was remarkable. This, this is the futures contract. It remarkably started just trading up. So what does my profit look like here? Well, maybe I bought 20% of the underlying as my initial hedge, and every day I'm buying a little bit more. But because the market's not gyrating, because it's generally moving up, all of my hedging transactions are making money. Even though in expectation I was only going to make these fall five vol points, I'm actually making a lot more because my hedging transactions are, are just fortuitously making money because the market's not gyrating, it's just generally moving up. So whereas my expected profit, if you just value the options, well here I've got a 22% versus 15, is, would have been $700,000. That's, that's what I told my boss I hoped to make on the trade. My actual profit on the last day was $3 million because I had made so much money on the hedge. Ooh. Can we get that back? Okay, so, uh, so now it's the last day of trading, and the future is... Uh, the future is at 85 and a half. And so let me tell you how the, so it's a Friday. These options expire on a Friday. Uh, it's, um, I think it's the spring. It's probably something like, uh, 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 let's see, it must have been March and June, it must have been June. Uh, and um, the options, stop trading at one o'clock in the afternoon. There's a final round of trading, then they stop trading. The futures market in uh, treasuries is open until three o'clock, then that stops trading. Uh, treasuries generally trade till around four, 4.30. Uh, you know, th there's no set time, but generally around 4.30, uh, the market stops trading for uh, treasuries. But you have until 5.30 to tell the futures exchange whether you want to sell these or not. Well, at 1 o'clock, these options that are at 85, the underlying treasury future is at 85 and a half, and I've sold these 86 calls, these options are trading at around eight cents. So, you know, like a good model building guy, I said, do I want to unwind this trade with, uh, do I want to pay eight, eight cents and lock in my three million dollar profit? So I plugged the uh, 85 and a half and I assumed a half a day to go into my Black Shoals option program. And I didn't get eight cents, I got two cents. I'd much rather be a seller than a buyer. But I'm not gonna do a trade for, you know, six cents, the transactions cost, whatever. But I'm not gonna buy these back, 
the, the calls that I've shorted because I'm not going to pay eight cents for something that's really worth two cents. So I didn't do it, and lo and behold, the futures close at around 85 and a half at three o'clock. Nothing is really happening at four o'clock. All the partners, my boss, they've gone off for a partner's weekend. They're off on a golf course. I tell them not to worry, I'm in full control. You know, it's, uh, it's a little before 4.30, got my feet up on the desk. I'm talking to the long bond trader about what he's doing for the weekend. You know, no problem. <coughs> so then Friday at 4.30, Federal Reserve cuts the uh, surprise cut of the uh, interest rate. And these futures aren't trading, but boy, are bonds screaming. I do a couple calculations, uh, assuming the same spread of futures to treasuries. And these futures, if they were trading, would be more like 88 or 89, even though they're stuck at 85 and a half because they're not trading. So meanwhile, I do a little calculation. I hope to make 700,000 on the trade. At one o'clock, I was up 3 million. At 4.30, I'm really down more like two, two and a half million. And, and I haven't even covered my position yet because the futures aren't trading. Uh, so what's the lesson from this? Um, well, I think that the lesson is, and I think it's somewhat the lesson of long-term capital too, is um, that models are good to help you uh, get your intuition on a trade. You know, so I used a model. I used the Black Shoals with a half a day to go to get some intuition, and I thought this was ridiculous. But you have to know where the models work and where the models break down. The Black Shoals model on a short dated option with, uh, that's uh, out of the money is notoriously bad. Why? Because the assumptions of continuous markets is probably not a good one. Later on when the smoke cleared, I redid my calculations using, you know, on the eight cents using a combined model that assumed continuous movement and jumps. And I saw that eight cents made a lot of, worked. Eight cents probably was a fair price. If I had known that, maybe I would have locked in my three million. But, so I think the lesson is you have, to, you have to understand the models you're using, where they work and in what regions there's problems. All right, one more lesson. This was, uh, this was something I saw in uh, 1986. Um, there was... Uh, this uh, Harvard MBA, uh, actually was a famous card counter, um, went to Harvard Business School, blackjack card counter, went to Harvard Business School, uh, graduated there in 83, went to Merrill Lynch as a mortgage trader, and boy, did he just skyrocket. In three years, he became head of their structured mortgage uh, department. Uh, and uh, so he's there at Merrill Lynch. On the other side, you've got this um, finance professor at uh, Chicago. He's doing some consulting for an SNL. The SNL really likes these mortgages. Um, you know, he feels that they're very cheap, but they're worried about all the prepayment risks that they would be bearing uh, from the mortgages. So, uh, they, they asked the professor, is there some way that we can construct a security that has the cheapness of mortgages but not the prepayment, uh, not all the prepayment risk? So the professor was talking to the uh, Merrill Lynch trader and they came up with this structure uh, called IOPO. IOs are interest only pieces. They, pieces of a mortgage, and PO are principal pieces of a mortgage. 
You take a mortgage and you split it into two pieces. One's just the interest, the coupon payments of the mortgage, and the other is the principal of the mortgage. So uh, if, if the mortgage were to prepay, you know, if the, if the borrower, if the homeowner prepays his mortgage, then the PO guy gets paid off. If, uh, if he doesn't prepay and he keeps paying his interest rate, that all goes to the IO guy. So clearly it was this IO piece that attracted uh, the SNL and um, the mortgage trader said, but boy, I can really sell this sexy PO piece. It's, it's got all the risk and you know, prepayment. Uh, people will love that. It's essentially a levered piece. People will love that. Um, I can sell that. I'll, I'll fill the uh, SNL on the interest piece and I'll inventory the PO piece and sell it at a high price. So we sold the IOs for about 50 cents on the dollar. So we took this mortgage at 100, split it into an IO and a PO at about 50 bucks each. Well, how does he hedge himself? He was only going to hold it for a few days. So he kind of said to himself, I'll just do a coarse hedge. Uh, what I'll do is, I've essentially got this whole pie, the mortgage, I'll, um, and I've sold half of it off. Well, what do I need to do? I need to sell something on the other side. You know, I've, um, I've, I've taken down an inventory of this mortgage, and I've sold off half of it. So really, what I need to do on my hedge is sell some treasuries on the other side. Sell the other half. So he kind of said to himself, well, maybe the hedge ratio is really a half. You know, one mortgage equals a half IO plus a half PO. I'll sell 50% treasuries on the other side. The answer is wrong. His math was a little wrong. He sort of said one equals a half plus a half. But in reality, one equals minus one plus two. He sold half the security off, but rather than having half the risk, he had twice the risk. How is that possible? Well, let's think about, let's think about it for, for a second here. Um, what happens when the market rallies to a mortgage? It prepays. So it prepays, so there's the, the PO gets paid off at 100. What happens when the market goes down? Well, the PO is definitely out there and for a long period of time. So you can think about this He's got more than twice the risk by being long these POs. He didn't need to sell half the treasuries. He needed to really sell two times the number of treasuries. And of course, the market did rally back there in 1986. And in just a few weeks' time, he lost over $100 million. And, um, I'm sure they gave him a promotion. So that's, that's three quick lessons that I saw in uh, the first few days. <laughs>